know, I know that there's some of you in here that I, I hesitate in a sense to reveal all of these things, but maybe it'll encourage you. But you know what? I've been ministering. I minister at least 20 times a week. I minister a lot. And there's, I'd say the vast majority of times I leave and I think, man, I could have done better. And I'm dissatisfied. I've never been pleased with a message that I've preached yet. I've been more pleased with it than at other times. But you know what? I could always do it better. There's more than what I share. And there's people that get up and walk out. And you know what? I have a tendency to get condemned and thinking, God, I could have done better. I listen to somebody else who's really blessed. And you know what? It's not jealousy. It's just like, God, I want to do the best I can. I want to measure up to those standards. And I have a tendency to condemn myself. And praise God, I've at least come to the place where I realize that and start feeling condemnation. I know that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ and I'm able to reject it and I'm able to rise above it. But I'm saying that, you know what, that reason that still comes to pass is because we've had this performance-based relationship type thing grilled into us so much that it's just nearly like it's a part of your DNA. When you were a little kid, you came home and said A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you did that, and then you say, now I've said my ABCs, tell me what you think of me. And they say, oh, you're wonderful, you're awesome. You got an A on your report card, they give you a present, they take you out, and they do something special. But if you get an F, what do they do? They don't say, oh, I'm so proud of you. You know, it's subtle. Sometimes it's not always said, but but it came across loud and clear that when you do well, you're accepted. When you do badly, you are rejected and you're punished. And in the natural realm, I don't think that it's wrong necessarily to learn that because with people, this is the way it's going to go. You go out and rob a bank, there are consequences. And so there is a balance here. We do need to learn that there are consequences and that we do need to perform well if we want to do well and if we want things to go well. But when it comes to God, your relationship with God is not based on your performance. It says in Romans chapter 4, verse 4 or 5 there, it says, God justifies the ungodly. God doesn't justify godly people. He only justifies the ungodly. Unless you humble yourself and admit your ungodliness, you cannot be justified, just as if I had never sinned. You can't be cleansed from your sin until you humble yourself and recognize your unworthiness. As long as you're maintaining your goodness and thinking, oh God, I'm good enough and I know you're going to move in my life, God can't justify you. He only justifies the ungodly. God only moves among the people like the publican and the sinner. I mean, the publican and the Pharisee. The Pharisee says, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like other men. I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. I thank you. I'm not like this old publican over here. Publican was a tax collector, a person who was treasonous to the Jewish nation, a thief. And God said that the the publican didn't even lift his eyes up to heaven. He just bowed himself and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said the publican, the one who admitted that he was a sinner, was the one that was justified. And the holy person who fasted twice every week and paid tithes, even on the herbs that were growing in his garden, that guy wasn't justified. You know why? Christ was made of no effect unto him because he was trying to earn God's favor. Nobody can earn God's favor. You can't be good enough. God's standard is so far beyond your ability to live up to it, it's impossible for you to ever deserve God's love and favor. You can't do it. The only way you can ever accept God's favor is as a gift. And if you won't accept it as a gift, you can't earn it. Period. That's it. You know, we give our materials away. We encourage people to give, but we tell them we'll give them up to three CDs a week free of charge. And I remember this woman who wrote in and she'd heard me on radio and she says, I want three free tapes. But she says, I I mean, she said, I want three tapes, but I don't want them free. Nobody gives me anything free. I pay my way. And so she said, give me a bill for these three tapes. And so we sent her the three free tapes. And we didn't send her a bill. And she waited a while, listened to the tapes, and then she wrote in and she says, the tapes were great. 
I appreciate it, but I asked for a bill. Nobody sent me a bill for those three tapes. And she says, I want three more tapes, but this time bill me for six. I didn't get billed for the first three. And so she explained that. We sent her three more tapes and didn't send her a bill. And finally she wrote in again and she says, I want three more tapes. And this time I want you to bill me for nine tapes. And she says, unless you send me a bill, I'll never get anything from you again. Nobody is going to give me anything free. And they brought this to me. And you know what? I I, uh, made a tape and sent it to her. And I said, lady, you hadn't got enough money to pay for my tapes. My tapes are life-changing. They're invaluable. I said, you can receive it as a gift or you can give me an offering if you want to, but you can't buy my tapes. And I said, you either accept them free or don't get them. And I don't remember whether she ever wrote into us again or not. But man, if that's true about my tapes, how in the world could you pay for what Jesus did for you? How could you earn what Jesus did for you? A lack of understanding this has made some people who've done a lot of really bad things think, oh God, I could never measure up, I could never pay, and it's kept them from trying. And it's made other people who've done really good compared to me or compared to somebody else get arrogant and put their faith in themselves instead of putting their faith in God. Both of those extremes are wrong. Who wants to be the best sinner that ever got rejected? You might be better than I am, but none of us deserve the things of God. You need to humble yourself. And you need to recognize that it is our trust in ourself. The fact that we tie God's love, acceptance, blessing, anointing, use to our performance that has made what Jesus did of none effect in your life. Or it's diminished the effect. And that's it. It's not your sin. It's not the fact that you don't have talents and abilities. It's not the fact that you're ugly or fat or whatever. You know what it is? It's the fact that you have limited God. You won't let God love you. You won't let God bless you. You aren't believing Him because your own heart has condemned you and you don't feel worthy. You need to recognize that you aren't worthy in yourself. But in Christ Jesus, you've been born again and you are now the righteousness of God. And you are righteous and clean and pure in His sight in the spirit man. And you have to stand fast in this liberty or you'll be entangled. That word entangled means like a net spread that you get your feet caught in. You'll fall back into this thing. You aren't going to hear one out of a thousand preachers say what I'm saying. Not very many preachers say this. Most of religion is putting everything on your back and telling you that you've got to perform and do certain things or God won't bless you. And about 100 out of 100 people outside of the church will tell you that everything is based on your performance. And they will condemn you. The world system doesn't operate by grace. It operates by performance. You could get a revelation of what I'm saying here and go back to your work on Monday and say, man, I heard this guy preach and I found out I'm righteous and and it's not my goodness and my performance and so I just want you to know I may or may not show up for work. I may or may not do the job because man, God loves me regardless of my performance. See how they'll respond. You will be fired. Jesus deals with you by grace, but your boss doesn't, your wife doesn't, your kids don't, your neighbors won't. There is no other role model. And if you don't make a deliberate attempt to grab hold of this and stand fast and encourage yourself and learn how to minister this to yourself, I guarantee you, you'll lose it because there's very, very few voices out there. You know, I had one man come up to me tonight and say, I'm the only person he will listen to. Well, now that's not right because I'm going to introduce you to a bunch right here. (laughs) We're going to have some powerful minutes, but there are a few. 
And you aren't going to hear this near often enough. Most people relate everything God is and has and can do to how holy you are. You know, Mike Hesh back here, the one that had the tumor on his chest, if you saw that testimony, that was the thing that was keeping his healing from happening. He knew it was God's will to heal him. He stood on it. When other people would have taken another route and have gone and just gotten the thing cut off or something, he was standing and believing God. He knew it was God's will. But he was... Christ was becoming of none effect in his healing because he thought he had to earn it. He had to do everything right. And that teaching set that he got, that's what freed him up is, that he already had it. God gave it to him as a gift. And when he saw that, then Christ began to start having an effect in the healing in his life. And that's how he was healed. There are some of you that may have come here thinking, that you know God can do miracles and that God can heal. And you've come believing that I'm going to lay hands on you. And all that may sound good, but you know what's really going on? You don't believe God will do it for you because you are under the law. You're thinking it's all based on performance. You know you haven't done it all right. You know you should have been studying the Word more and you've been watching all the football games. You should have been doing this and that, and you hadn't done it. And so you don't have any confidence in yourself. And you're thinking that, well, Andrew, God will hear his prayer. You know what? If that's the way that you're thinking, then it won't work. Because Christ will become of none effect, because you are still under this law mentality. God loves you just as much as he loves me. There is zero difference. And some of you think, oh, you don't know what I've done. Well, then you don't know what Jesus has done. Jesus loves you every bit as much as He loves me. The only difference between you and me is that I've been renewing my mind and I may believe it stronger than you do. And because of that, I might allow the power of God to flow through me in a way that some of you want. So yes, we do pray one for another. But the truth is, every one of you in here have the exact same things that I do. I do not have a gift of healing. I don't have a gift of miracles. And I feel like this needs to be explained because in the body of Christ, we have basically magnified these people that do have anointings. There are some people who are anointed in the area of healing and they have a supernatural anointing that makes it easier for other people to get healed. I'm not one of those guys. My anointing is teaching. And yet I see a lot of miracles. You know why? Because I help get people out of the thinking that they're unworthy and that God won't heal them. And I help your faith work, but I don't have a special anointing for healing. Some of you think, oh, man, you just don't know what I've done. If you knew me as well as you know you, you wouldn't have any more faith in my prayers than you got in your prayers. I hadn't done some of the things that, you know, that that are considered really bad. But I mean, again, if you keep the whole law, James 2.10, and offend in one point, you become guilty of all. I haven't raped and murdered and plundered and done all of that. But you know what? I am not what I should be. I fail, and I guarantee you, I don't get from God what I get because I deserve it. It's because I stand fast in the liberty that Christ gave me. It's because my faith is in Him and not in myself. And every one of you can do that. That's what I'm going to be ministering on all week long. This is what I'm going to be talking about. And I tell you, if you can abide this and open up your heart, I think this is going to help you. And praise God, after a little bit of time of taking these truths and applying it to your life, I believe you'd make a better score on this test. Amen? Praise God. I think it's going to make a big difference. You know, if there's anybody here tonight who doesn't know Jesus, I don't want to take for granted that every person is born again just because you're here. You may have come with somebody or who knows. You know, we had a, this is a great testimony, but we had a, a young man call in this week to our phone center and Clarence, one of the prayer ministers, answered it and talked to this guy for an hour and 20 minutes on the phone. And it turns out he was a Satanist. And why he called us, I don't know. But he called, and Clarence got to talking to him, and this guy was just so confused. Clarence answered his questions, wound up praying with him, 
to get born again. He prayed and got born again and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. He was going to be ordained this Sunday to be a Satanist high priest. He had been in the Satanist church and been promoted. And this Sunday he was going to be ordained to be a Satanist high priest. And he got born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost. And while Clarence was praying with him, he says, there's a man standing over in the corner who's shining. And uh, Clarence says, well, that's Jesus. (laughs) It was awesome. So I don't know why a Satanist priest called us, but I'm glad he did. There may be some of you here that I don't know why you would come here if you weren't already born again. But you know, there's a lot of people who think that they're saved just because they go to church or they try and be good. But maybe... As you've been here tonight, you recognize, you know what? My faith really isn't in a Savior. I've never been changed. And everything I've said tonight is based on you becoming a new person in Christ. When you get born again, you get changed on the spirit level. And you become a new person. If that's never happened to you, you need to be born again. It's not joining a church. It's not just being moral. It's not just trying to live up to a code. It's all about Jesus became sin, took all of your sin, and He gives you righteousness as a gift. And when that happens, it changes your life. And the Scripture says you know that you've passed from death unto life. If some of you in here don't have that assurance, you need to be born again. And then after you get born again, Jesus told His disciples, He says, don't go anywhere, don't tell anybody, don't do anything until you receive power from on high. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, He anoints you with gifts. You can do things that you can't do in yourself. He will give you supernatural ability. And there's a lot of things that happen. One of them is you pray in tongues, which some people think, man, I don't understand that. I've got a book I'll give you that will answer those questions. But one of the things that the Holy Spirit does, He brings back to your remembrance what Jesus spoke to you, and He leads you into all truth and teaches you about Jesus. You cannot understand and retain what I've talked about tonight without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You'll lose it. It says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. You can't understand the things of God with just your brain. The Word is written to your heart. The Holy Spirit inspired it. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the person who wrote the Word. And He will interpret it to you and explain it to you. And you will begin to start having revelation knowledge. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you will not be able to walk in what we've talked about. You will go back to a performance-based relationship with God. So you need to receive salvation and you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in this gift of speaking in tongues. Is there anybody in here tonight who needs one or both of those and you'd like me to pray with you? First of all, let me say this. Somebody might say, well, I believe I've got the Holy Spirit, but I don't speak in tongues. I believe it's possible to have the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues. I did. I received the Holy Spirit before I spoke in tongues because I was a Baptist. And I was told that that was of the devil. And I wanted the Holy Spirit, but I didn't want anything to do with these demon tongues. And I didn't speak in tongues for a period of time. But I tell you, finally, I learned and I renewed my mind. And when I started speaking in tongues, it's like I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit all over again. And I can promise you, it is an important part of it. It's like a pair of tennis shoes. When you get them, they all come with tongues. If you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God will give you the ability to speak in tongues. Somebody says, well, do I have to? No, you get to. It's a privilege. Why wouldn't you want some? Somebody says, well, I don't understand what that's all about. i got a book that will explain it. I'm not going to preach another hour and explain it. But I'm telling you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues is powerful. Somebody's thinking, so are you saying that if I don't have the Holy Ghost... I won't go to heaven? No, that's not what I'm saying. You can still go to heaven without the Holy Spirit and you can get there quicker without the Holy Spirit because you aren't going to have any power. Some will kill you along the way. You can still go to heaven without the Holy Spirit, but why would you want to? 
Man, the Holy Spirit is powerful and you need it. Somebody might be like, I didn't know you were one of those guys. You just stand there, sit there. You don't scream and spit and yell. I didn't know I was getting into one of those meetings. Well, we got you now, amen. And you know what? They will talk about you for coming here, so you might as well get something. You're going to be criticized. Get something for the effort, amen. Man, you need this. How many of you in here already have the baptism of the Holy Spirit in speaking tongues? Would you recommend it? Amen. So you're in the minority. If you would like to join the majority and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'd like you to raise your hand so that I can pray with you and you could receive here tonight. Just be bold and raise your hand. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Praise God. Man, that's great. Amen. If you raised your hand, or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come forward? We're going to pray with you right here and help you to receive. Thank you, Jesus. Just come stand right down here. And if you would, don't stand behind each other, but stand beside each other because I'm going to have students come up here and lay hands on you and it'll help them to be able to minister to you better. So stand side by side instead of behind and spread out across the front and we're going to have other people come and help minister to you. Isn't this great? I tell you what, guys, this is going to change your life. My life changed more when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit outwardly than when I got born again. Now, getting born again is absolutely essential. I'm not minimizing it, but I'm saying it's inward, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit releases and draws out this power that God put in you at salvation, and I believe you're going to change dramatically. You're going to go back, and your wives are going to say, what happened to you? Not because you're preaching, Adam, but because now it's... The Bible said one of the things that the Holy Spirit does in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit which is given unto you. I tell you, the love of God for you personally and then the love of God through you to other people is going to make a huge difference in your life. I believe that this is going to change things. Amen? Praise God. Anybody else? Still got some people coming up here. You know, this is a real simple question. Do you speak in tongues? If you don't, you ought to be up here. It's that really that simple. Anybody else? Somebody's probably saying, well, I don't speak in tongues, but I don't understand it all. I don't understand it all either, and I still speak in tongues. You don't have to understand it all to speak in tongues. And I know you got questions. We aren't going to force you to do anything. Nobody up here is going to hit you on the back and tell you to do something. We're just going to pray with you. And if you're ready, you can speak in tongues right now. If not, we're going to give you a book and pray for you. And praise God, you can go home and receive the truth and speak in tongues when you get ready. But if you don't speak in tongues, you ought to be up here. Somebody's thinking, well, what if I go up there and nothing happens? Well, if you don't come up here, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> You got nothing to lose. You got everything to gain. I'm going to give you a free book. What a deal. Man, there's no reason not to be up here. If you don't speak in tongues, you should be up here. Anybody else? Okay, before I can pray for, for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Scripture says that Jesus is the one who gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you have to receive Jesus before you receive the gift. You must be born again first. So is there anybody here who's not absolutely certain? There's a lot of people that are just assuming, well, I'm a good person. I've tried. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Isn't that enough? The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 19, you believe that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. 
Man, that's a very sarcastic statement saying if you believe that Jesus is God, you had not done anything that the devil hasn't done. The one thing you have to do is not just believe that He exists and that He was the Son of God, but you have to make Him your Lord. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. That doesn't mean you're going to say, I'll never make another mistake because you can't fulfill that. But you are saying, I'm turning my life over. I want you to be Lord. Doesn't mean you'll do it perfectly, but you want Him to take absolute control. You want to make Him your Lord. And if you will do that, then you'll be born again. Is there anybody here who's not done that and you need to first of all pray and make Jesus your Lord? Anybody, if that's you, you need to raise your hand. Raise it so I can see it. Anybody? If you aren't sure, that's fine. We'll pray and make sure. Here's three guys. Anybody else? Here's another one. Man, this is important. Here's another one. You can't get... Here's a couple more. You cannot receive the Holy Spirit. This won't work until you receive Jesus. So you can't receive the Holy Spirit. You can't speak in tongues until you receive Jesus. So this is imperative. Everything else is based on this. So this is about six or seven people. Anybody else? Anybody else? You've got to make sure. Praise God. What I'm going to do, I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer, and I'm going to base it on that scripture that I was quoting about. If you make Jesus your Lord and believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's that simple. Jesus has already done it. Now it's just a matter. You don't have to ask Him to do anything. He's already done His part. It's all about you receiving. It's all about you making Jesus your Lord and then believing that He's forgiven you. And when you do that, the Bible says you shall be saved. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to say the things that you need to say and I'd like to ask everybody in here to help, help us by repeating this. And if you will say these words, it's not magic. It's not like you just say the words and you're instantly saved. It says you have to believe it in your heart. But if you will say these words and believe it in your heart, then you'll be born again. You'll become a brand new person. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Just say this. Say, Father, Father. I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I believe that you are alive. That you now live in me. I am saved. I am forgiven. Right now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Do you believe that? Awesome. Do you believe that? Isn't that great? You know, if you meant that, then according to the Scripture, you just became a totally new person on the inside. You may still look the same on the outside, but on the inside, you are brand new. And the Bible says that when you get born again, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So now, every person up here has prayed and made Jesus their Lord, and according to Scripture, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. What that means is, when you got born again, God created you to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So this is what you were made for. There's no way that God is going to fail to give any of you the Holy Spirit because you were created to be His temple. He wants you to have the Holy Spirit more than you want to have Him. So we aren't going to have to beg and plead. Some people will teach that you got to get rid of all sin in your life. That goes against everything that I taught tonight. It's not based on your performance. If you have sin and problems in your life, instead of disqualifying you, that qualifies you because you need the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you need His power. So don't let some sense of unworthiness or performance-based thing keep you from feeling like God's going to give you the Holy Spirit. He wants to give you His power. So all we're going to do is just pray and open up the doors of this temple and welcome Him in. And then I'd like to ask our Bible college students to come up here, and we're going to have people stand behind you and lay hands on you, because the Bible says that through the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit is given. You can actually release the Holy Spirit through hands. It's like when your car battery goes dead. You pull another car up, and you put on those jumper cables, and you transmit that power. These are our jumper cables. 
Amen. We're going to lay hands on you and release this power of the Holy Spirit into your life. And then... I'm going to lead you in a prayer where we ask and receive the Holy Spirit. They're going to lay hands on you. And then when we get through, I want you to start thanking God for giving you the Holy Spirit. Don't ask anymore. There's a time to ask and then there's a time to believe. And so we're going to ask. They're going to lay hands on you. We're going to believe. And I want you to start thanking God that He gave you the Holy Spirit. I don't care what you feel like. Sometimes people have great feelings. When I received the Holy Spirit, I didn't feel a thing, but I got Him. And so we're going to ask. They're going to lay hands on you. And then we're just going to, by faith, start thanking God that He gave you the Holy Spirit. And at that time, then I want you to lift your hands like when somebody sticks a gun in your back. Because when they do that, you mean, I surrender, I yield. This is your way of surrendering and yielding. And we're going to lift our hands, and I want you to start thanking God. The Bible says that when you lift up your hands, you bless the Lord. This blesses God. It's a sign of surrender. So we're going to ask. They're going to lay hands on. You're going to lift your hands. Start thanking God that He gave you the Holy Spirit. Do it out loud. And then those of us that know how to pray in tongues are going to pray in tongues. Because the Bible says that when you're praying in tongues, you're giving thanks well unto God. So we're going to start thanking God in our heavenly language And when we do, we want you to switch from praying in English and start praying in tongues and thanking Him in a new language. It's really that simple. I know you have a lot of questions. I'm going to give you this book that will answer them. But here's here's the number one problem that I had and that other people have. And that is that they think that the Holy Spirit is going to take your mouth and make it talk. Kind of like when you throw up. You just can't stop it. Put your hand over your mouth, do whatever, and it's going to come out anyway. That's not how speaking in tongues is. It's very similar to when I taught tonight. I believe that God spoke through me. But He didn't force me to talk. That's the reason it came out in my personality. It's the reason it came out in Texan. It was me that spoke, but it was the Holy Spirit that inspired it. That's the way speaking in tongues is. You have to speak. You have to start making sounds. And by faith, believe that the Holy Spirit is inspiring it. And at first, most people are listening to themselves so much, it doesn't sound really good. It's kind of like a baby when they first talk. It's all, it, it may not sound like much, but you know what? Just like a father, when he hears that little baby go, Dad, Dad, boy, he knows exactly what they're trying to say. And he's pleased with it. You may not feel like it's really a great language or whatever, but you're trying to communicate. Your Heavenly Father understands. And the moment you quit worrying about it and you quit thinking about it and you put your mind on the Lord, you'll find out it just flows out of you. It's not really you. It's you speaking, but it's the Holy Spirit inspiring it. And anyway, this book will explain it in more detail. But if you're ready, you can pray in tongues with us tonight. Isn't that a good deal? And this will change your life. Amen? Everybody understand what we're going to do? The Bible says believers will speak with new tongues. I want you to say, I'm a believer. believer. And I will speak in tongues. tongues. Father, I thank you for all of these men. Thank you, Father, that every one of them now has prayed this prayer. And we believe that they are born again and that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit that you created us to fill with your Holy Spirit. And so we just open up the doors of our heart and say, Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Come give us power. Come give us this gift of speaking in tongues and all of the other gifts. Father, we want the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we open up our heart and welcome you in. We lay hands on you now in Jesus' name and release the Holy Spirit. We release the power of the Holy Spirit right now. And Father, I thank you that these men are being filled with your power. That power is coming upon them through the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Now let's lift your hands and go to thanking God. Thank Him that His word's true, that He gave you the Holy Spirit, and from this moment on you are God-possessed. 
You have the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit flowing in your life. Talk out loud. You can't talk with your mouth closed. Talk out loud. Now those of you that speak in tongues, let's start praying in tongues right now and thanking God. And I want you to switch from praying in English to speaking in tongues. You have to speak and believe that the Holy Spirit is inspiring it. Right now, just be bold. Talk. You got to open your mouth to speak in tongues. You can't talk in tongues and English at the same time. You're going to have to quit thanking Him in English and thank Him in tongues. There you go. Man, there's lots of them praying in tongues right now. That's the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says when you're praying in tongues, you're building yourself up on your most holy faith. Man, this is promoting you. You're bypassing the doubt and the unbelief that's in your brain. And you're talking out of your born-again spirit. It's awesome. Awesome. Just don't worry about it. Quit listening to yourself and go to worshiping God. Don't think about yourself. Think about how your father is listening to this that is minus all of your fear and your doubt. You're praying out of the Spirit. He's pleased with it. You're communicating to Him. It may not mean much to you, but He understands everything you're saying. Thank you, Jesus. Just be bold. Pray right now. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right, let me have your attention here for a minute. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Many of you are praying in tongues, but you know whether you spoke in tongues or not, I believe God gave you the Holy Spirit because He said He would. When I first prayed and asked the Lord to give me the Holy Spirit, it took me three and a half years to speak in tongues. But that's because I was a Baptist. And I had so many wrong ideas and I had fear about this being of the devil or what was going to happen. And it kept me. The Holy Spirit will not force you to speak in tongues. But I finally got into the Word. I found out all of these things. And I don't think anybody's ever had more trouble speaking in tongues than I did. But God answered my questions, and now I speak in tongues a lot. So what I'm saying is, I believe that even if you didn't speak in tongues, that whatever it is that's hindering you, this book will deal with that and answer it. And this book also talks about what true salvation is. So for those of you who pray to receive Jesus, it will explain what all of that is. And it's really, really important that you get a full understanding of salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that Satan can't steal this from you. What you've experienced here is more important than what any of you understand. I can guarantee it. I don't care even if you felt something awesome. It's bigger than what you felt. You need to understand this and get the full benefit of it. And so I want to give every single person here a book. And also we have some guys, these are people that travel with me to my meetings. And they deal with thousands of people that came and did just what you did. And they will answer your questions. They'll pray with you. They'll do anything to help you that they possibly can. So this is Ashley Teredes right here. He's got his hand up with that book we're going to give you. And if you'd follow him for just a minute, he's going to take you over here to a room, give you a book. If you need anything else, they'll help you. Amen. Just go with Ashley. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? Thank you, Jesus. I tell you what, this is going to change their lives. If this does half as much for you as it did for me, you're going to be stronger than horseradish. Awesome.
God bless you all. We'll talk later. Praise the Lord. Also, there's a lot of people that came here needing prayer. If you need prayer, they've got people that will pray with you over there. It'll only take a moment and then you'll be free to come back. But, you know, I'd like to ask some of our Bible college students to come up here. And again, I don't mind praying with you. That's not the deal. But I just can't pray with every person. And like I said, I don't have a special anointing. It's the truth that has set me free and has enabled my faith to work. And man, these Bible college students have been sitting under the Word four hours a day for a couple of years. They are chomping at the bits to lay hands on someone. Isn't that right? (laughs) This guy right here is a fanatic, amen. He can pray with you. So anyway, I'd like to ask some of our Bible college students to come up here, and I'm going to offer them to you to help you help us pray for people, And again, I want to emphasize that some of you may think I'm the only one that can pray, but I just can't pray for every single person in here. But Jesus will flow through all of us. And uh, you can be healed through these people. Amen? So if you have a need, and if you want someone to pray with you, I want to offer these students to you and ask you to come up here and just believe that God is going to do a miracle in your life. If you need prayer right now, I want you to get up out of your seat and come forward, and we're going to let one of our Bible college students pray for you. The rest of you, if you'll wait just a minute, let these people get out into the aisles, and uh, we're going to stand here and pray. I'm going to agree, and so you're welcome to stay here and pray with us. Also, remember that our CBC break room is to the right as you exit these doors, and if you will go down there, I think they have... uh, some refreshments or something. They also have uh, some games. And main thing is just to fellowship with each other. And then we're going to have breakfast back here from 7 to 8 in the morning. And I think our service starts at 9 o'clock. 8.30, excuse me. 8.30 is when our service starts. And I encourage everybody to be back. We start on time. If you get here at 8.35, you're going to be late. So get here on time. Be early. Amen. Praise God. If you desire to go, you're free to go. You're free to stay and pray with us. But uh, praise God. You're blessed. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, Gary, we got a guy standing over here that needs prayer. Nobody's... So uh, if you could help organize that, would be good. Father, we thank you that it is your will for every single person to be well. That Jesus has already paid for our healing. And Father, we believe, like I was sharing tonight that the only thing that makes Christ of no effect is our trust in ourself and our trying to earn and perform. Father, we come tonight believing that your word says that if we lay hands on the sick, they shall recover, that if two of us agree touching anything, it shall be done. So we are doing what your word says, and we believe that it's coming to pass through what Jesus did, not through our goodness, not through our holiness. So we pray for all of these right now, and we thank you, Father, for miracles taking place. Miracles. Those of you that are still in here, listen for just a minute. There's there's people in here that have been struggling with, you can't sleep. You just don't sleep good. God's healing you tonight. You're going to have supernatural sleep. If that's you, I want you to stand and raise your hands so I can see who this is. I believe God's healing you, and you're going to sleep in supernatural tonight. Amen? I want you right now to believe that here's the healing power of God. Father, I release this word and say in the name of Jesus that this insomnia or pain or whatever it is, it keeps them from sleeping. We rebuke this. Satan, you loose them and let them go. Father, the Scripture says it's vain to rise up early and to stay up late because you give your beloved sleep. 
Father, we believe that you are giving them sleep right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you that they lay down in peace and sleep because you make them dwell in safety. Thank you that fear is gone, that worry is gone, that torment of all kind is gone, oppression is gone, and we believe and just speak a supernatural rest over all of them. And Father, I thank you that it's healed now and their body is recovering, and that Father, they're going to have a great night's sleep. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we agree and we receive this. Somebody, the reason you couldn't sleep is because you had pain, a lot of pain, and you just can't seem to sleep. Who's that? If that's you that had the pain, I want you to raise your hand so I can see who this is. I rebuke this pain right now in Jesus' name and command it to leave. And Father, I thank you that this pain stops, cease, desist right now in Jesus' name. Satan, you loose them. And whatever caused that pain, I loose the anointing of God to flow through their body and to bring healing back unto them in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we agree and we receive this healing now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Boy, that's the anointing of God setting you free. Father, we receive this. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. There's a number of people here that you've had problems in your shoulders. It's hard for you to raise your hands. It's painful or either you don't have freedom of movement. If that's you, I want you to stand and raise your hand. It may not feel good, but I want you to raise your hand. Here's the healing power of God. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I command these shoulders to be healed. Whatever's been damaged, any fusion in these bones, Father, I just release your anointing and command the miracle power of God to flow. Amen. There's somebody that didn't have freedom of movement, painful. You can start moving your arms around. Feels good. You've been healed supernaturally. You've been told it can't be healed, but it can. Here's the healing power of God. You are healed in the name of Jesus. Who in here has already had the pain leave? Right here? Here's brothers. Here's three, four, five, six, seven. Anybody else? Eight? Already had the pain leave. Nine? Here's a dozen people or so, and you know what? I believe all the rest of you have been healed. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of time, but you believe that you're healed right now. You expect to start moving and doing things that you couldn't do. Thank you, Jesus. Al, I believe you're healed. You got any pain? How do you feel? A lot better. You know why you feel a lot better? Because you've been healed. I believe you're getting better and better and better. You're leaving this place completely well in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody's ears are being opened right now. I'm assuming that you have partial hearing or you couldn't hear this. We don't have an interpreter for the deaf. But if you've got a hearing loss, partial hearing loss or ringing in the ear hearing problem, I want you to stand and raise your hand. Here's the healing power of God. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I release this power. And deafness, we command you to leave all of these men now. Leave and be gone now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Now, Father, I loose your anointing, and I believe that your power and anointing is touching whatever was damaged in these ears. We command those nerves to come back alive, resurrect and work in the name of Jesus. We command the ringing to stop. We command distortion to stop. Father, I thank you that there is a complete range of sound, that none of the frequencies are lost. I just re release the anointing of God. In ears, you are healed. You can hear now in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Well, that's the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you that you are touching ears right now and that they are opening up. That, Father, they are going home completely healed, normal. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We agree and we receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Can anybody in here already tell a difference in your hearing? If that's you, I want you to wave at me so I can tell that you, you, you already tell a difference. Anybody? Right back here? Here's three people. Anybody else? Four people right here. Man, praise God. Five over here. I believe every, here's six. Some of you, it's just coming gradually. You're having to check yourself out. Here's another one. Seven. I believe that every one of you, your hearing is healed, and from this time forth you recover. The Bible says you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I believe you're recovering from this time on in Jesus' name. Praise God. Father, we receive this. We receive these miracles. We receive the Word of God. Thank you, Father, that this Word's going to make a difference in people's lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We agree and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Looks like everybody who wants prayer is being prayed for or has already been prayed for. So I'll let you go. Remember, we'll be back in the morning. Also, there's time back here to visit and fellowship. You're dis-